I'm Pete Wernick and I play the five string banjo and I do a lot of bluegrass teaching ever since I was in my teens and I'm 71 as we speak. What is it about bluegrass that sets it apart from other genres? The instrumentation. Uh, there is a lot of things that that leads to but you could take a song that uh, like uh, Del McCurry did Learning the Blues, it's a Frank Sinatra yeah. song. And Dirks Bentley suggested it could be done by the Del McCurry band. Well, when they do it, it becomes a bluegrass song. Yeah. And why? Because of the instrumentation, primarily because, uh, in fact, I asked Jimmy Martin what makes a bluegrass song. And he said, it's got a banjo and a mandolin and a fiddle and a guitar and a bass. That's what makes a bluegrass song. And <laughs> yeah. he says, uh, this is right out of my red songbook where I interviewed a lot of the famous singers of bluegrass. He says, they say, Jimmy, we got a song for you. Uh, this you like this song? He says I don't like that song. Play, show me another one. He says. He says well you, you don't want this one. This is an Eddie Arnold song. He says let me hear it because if I like it I'll make it a bluegrass song. So that's I believe Jimmy Martin had it right. Now I won't even try to elaborate on that. If you take a song, put bluegrass instrumentation on, even if it's Punch Brothers, they've got those five yeah. instruments, and it's going to be hard to call something that they do not bluegrass. Now, it's you, most bluegrass has simple chord progression, yeah. but not necessarily. Newgrass Revival has done songs unmistakably bluegrass with complicated chord progression, so does Alison Krauss. Um, I've written instrumentals that have many chords in them, but they're bluegrass, they're just on the progressive end of bluegrass. If you start adding a lot of instrumentation to bluegrass like electric guitar and drums, then you're, or horns, uh, you are in danger of saying, have people saying, well, that, that ain't bluegrass. Yeah. And I have a band like that. It has a clarinet, it has a vibraphone, uh, it has a drummer, but he plays mostly brush, almost entirely brushes, and then we have a bass, and me on banjo. And it might sound like I'm trying to play jazz, but I'm not. I'm trying to play, I the band is called Flexigrass, and the music, I call it Flexigrass, where we play Foggy Mountain Breakdown, we play bluegrass vocals, and we have convincing bluegrass vocals, but when you hear a break, it's going to be a vibraphone or a clarinet yeah. playing what a guitar can't play. Yeah. Uh, but they're informed by the sound of uh, the guitar as played by bluegrass. The clarinet player learns fiddle licks, and then he can play what only a clarinet can play. And it makes for an interesting hybrid. So I just got off stage where we had uh, a hammer dulcimer, we had a claw hammer banjo, we had a, a drum kit, and we had David Holt playing uh, mouth bow. And I like calling that kind of music flexigrass, where we couldn't do that if, flex, yeah. if bluegrass hadn't come first. And we are we are elaborating on the bluegrass model the way the instruments fit together. Do you see um, two camps like neo traditional and progressive? And if you oh, do, most definitely. Uh, there's what do you think about that? Well, I think it's great. You know, if you had a garden and you only had one plant in the garden and they were all the same kind of plant, that'd be nice. But it's not good ecology to have only one kind of plant, and it's not interesting to have only one kind of plant. So as soon as there was Flat and Scruggs and Bill Monroe, both on the Grand Ole Opry, yeah. Monroe objected to them being on the Opry because he thought they were just ripping him off. But they, <laughs> but they weren't. They had their own material. Yeah, they also had Dobro to distinguish themselves. And their sound was different from Monroe. And after a while, Monroe said, oh, these are not my competitors. These are my children. These are my offspring. And he and his manager said, you're the father of bluegrass. Did you realize that? He said, oh, that sounds good. I, I'm not saying I knew the, di the dialogue that actually happened, but uh, what do you Ralph, think about Ralph Rinsler did that. And, and, and from that point on, the country gentlemen uh, were doing like the theme from Exodus. They were doing Bob Dylan material in, in the 60s. And so there was already the beginning of uh, traditional versus progressive. Some people say, I don't want to hear a minor chord in a bluegrass song. Carter Stanley mm -hmm. uh, and Ralph had a fight. <laughs> they had a fight about the tune Hard Times. It's an instrumental written by Ralph Stanley because Carter objected to the minor chord in it. It became a hit. They, they, they did record it. They also recorded Finger Poppin' yeah. Time, which was a hit back in the uh, 50s. And that didn't fly, but Hard Times flew. Yeah. So uh, there's been people in both directions. 
the hot rise. Well, that's what I was going to say. You guys were we one of the both. bands that broke the doors down. Well, we did both. And because we weren't from the South, although Tim's from West Virginia in the first place, so he had enough of the feel of Southern singing so that we never had an op any obstacles over whether Tim's singing was accepted as real hardcore bluegrass singing. And we did. We love traditional bluegrass, so we did Stanley Brothers and Hot uh, and uh, Flat and Scruggs material, Monroe material, and then we'd even write songs. Uh, we uh, uh, Tim and Nick wrote a song called um, "Footsteps So Near." Ended up on a Ralph Stanley II record with the authors as traditional, meaning they thought it was an old song, yeah. but it was written by Tim and Nick, and they even changed the name of it. They called it Wolf County. <laughs> because uh, it, it's about a true thing that happened in Wolf County, Kentucky. And so the idea that we could be mistaken, our work could be mistaken for an old song that goes back, a timeless old song, but it was original, that shows how dialed into tra trad bluegrass we were uh, in those days. And uh, But I also wrote multi, multi chord instrumentals. I used a phase shifter on my banjo. And that was a way of saying, we're not going to just be like everybody. And uh, I was a little worried about the phase shifter because I thought maybe it's just going to really turn off people. And uh, I, it did turn off some people. We, there was one gig that they said, if you're bringing the phase shifter, I'm not hiring you. And the band agreed to get not get hired because we didn't want somebody dictating our music to us. Uh, but otherwise, I had um, Joe, uh, Joe Meadows, who fiddled with Jim and Jesse, loved it. And came up to me to tell me how much he loved it. Norman Blake, of all people, said, I didn't think I was going to like it, but I really think it's good. So when I had those kinds of yeah. endorsements, I, I felt like I didn't, I didn't want to go out and offend people, but I wanted to try new things. What's the legacy of Hot Rise? I mean, I know the band is still still around, but I mean, Where we are looking playing. back on it, though, what is the legacy? Well, because we're not from the heartland, we started from... Colorado. Currently, you know, we have two guys who live in Nashville. Tim moved to Nashville, but for years and years we were from Colorado, and and a lot of people were sort of sus suspicious of us. But then when they heard that we really did our homework and we knew how to play the old stuff, they uh, we never had any problems with that. And then we would gingerly sort of throw in things that a trad band wouldn't do. And we slowly kind of made our way as a centrist band by paying a certain amount of attention to both sides of the spectrum. During the time we were together, the Johnson Mountain Boys broke up and also Skyline, which is a Northeastern progressive band, they both broke up. And I, I believe they weren't getting quite enough work because being in the left wing or the right wing, shall we say, of bluegrass meant you had too small of an audience to sustain you. If you were a centrist band like us and the seldom seen and some other ones, um, then then you could appeal to the full spectrum and, and we did well in that context. So uh, we also wrote a lot of songs, some of which are now jam session standards. And I think the legacy of any band, like nobody does, oh, we're gonna do a Ricky Skaggs song because he doesn't write. Yeah. Uh, he's great. He can't beat his singing, but he doesn't have any of his own material that only he does. I mean, he introduced Highway 40 Blues and some other stuff, but he didn't write it. But when you have the writer in the band, like Flat and Scruggs and Monroe and Stanley Brothers had, Jimmy Martin's band had a lot of original material, thanks to Paul Williams. Uh, so having original material is very, very important, and it is definitely part of our legacy. And I've been you know, telling guys in the Honor Mountain String, and you need to put out a songbook. Because like Flat and Scruggs and everybody else and, and Hot Rise put out a song so their fans could learn their songs, but Yonder's fans don't play. Yeah, exactly. And, and I, I think they should, and yeah. I'm going to have Dave Johnston do a workshop with me at Telluride awesome. where he leads the crowd in doing Yonder songs. Yeah. And they should bring their instruments and we'll, and, and we'll get that going in the new wave of jam bands. Is it weird that um, you came up as a, as a young man and had all those um, bluegrass greats that were in their older age at that point around and now you have, you're not old by any means, but now you have people looking at you as I'm, one of I'm the, older now than Bill Monroe was when I first started listening to him. What do you think about that? Well, it's one of the things about being 71 years old. When I uh, interviewed, I was 20 
you when I had a, I had a bluegrass radio program at my college. It was the only bluegrass radio program. Where'd you go to college? Columbia College okay. in New York City. Ivy League, you know, and they had yeah. a very well uh, well uh, geared radio station called WKCR. And I had a program for seven years on that station, and I was the only bluegrass DJ in New York. So they wanted to get interviewed by me. Yeah, yeah. They needed the publicity. And uh, when Monroe was in town one time. Now, what um, years are we talking about here? 63 through 70. Oh, man. You must have had a great uh, listenership based on the you know, folk revival at that time, too. Well, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you so you're everybody at, knew about me because yeah, I had a bluegrass radio talk show. Talk about being in a place, man. Well, that's like uh, some people call me the Forrest Gump of bluegrass because <laughs> because I ended up being a eyewitness to a lot of stuff. I took my seven inch reel reel to reel tape recorded down to the very first bluegrass festival, Fincastle, Virginia, nineteen sixty five. Uh, it was called the Roanoke Bluegrass Festival, and there's Mac Wiseman, Bill Monroe, Jimmy uh, Martin, the, both Stanley brothers. And I interviewed Carter and Ralph Stanley. Wow. We didn't know Carter was going to die the very next year, but I interviewed all these guys. And they and Monroe was on my radio show. We, uh, David Grisman helped yep. arrange that. The, he uh, uh, we took he he recorded it on a top level tape recorder. I went up fifth floor walk up, which is where Monroe and his band were staying during an engagement in the city in New York. And uh, so I went up there, David had the recorder, and there's the full band, including Peter Rowan, who is yep. singing on stage yep. now. And we're, this happened over 50 years ago. It's so cool that. Was that Peter when Rowan still, and Grisman started hanging out? No, well, they, they knew each other yeah. before that, but, um, uh, but they were buds. And. Uh, 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 Richard Green was in the band, Lamar Greer and James Monroe, and I interviewed each one of them during the hour, including Monroe, and they played all these songs, and it was a thrill of my life, and I was trying to sound very grown up, I of course still have a recording of it. David wants have you to digitized put, that? Yes. and, and uh, that, That's unbelievable. Yeah, it's very high quality recording and it, the tape did not degenerate. The, the the digitizer was very impressed. He says, what was this recorded on? I said, a Nagra. He said, oh, that explains it because it had a ton of signal on it and it's worth putting out as a record. But I was a 20-year-old college student, so... Were you I'm aware of what you were doing? Yeah, like, I, I, I mean, knew looking I, back, that stuff's like I, I wasn't priceless. thinking, I wasn't thinking about 2017. I was yeah. thinking about 1966, yeah. which is the year that yeah. I did this. I didn't, you know, twenty-year-olds don't think about what they're going to be doing 50 years from now. But they you must have, don't. You, but you're definitely aware of the magic.